Welcome everybody to the Lake Bluff School District 65 Board of Education Committee, the whole meeting for October uh, 13th, 2015. Uh, mm -hmm. Sitting in for our Thanks, secretary, uh, secretary uh, is Julie Gottschall. So if you could please take a roll call, please. Mark Berry. Present. Leanne Charlotte, absent. Julie yeah. Gottschall, present. Richard Hegg, absent. Philip Hood. Present. John Rose. Present. Susan Ryder, absent. That's four. That's a quorum. We can begin. Uh, we'll begin with the opportunity for public comment. If anybody would like to address the, door, the board, please don't hesitate to do so now. But since no. I could have put you as an October uh, birthday. We could. So it's not on the agenda. <laughs> that's, 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 that's just yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, Jay could should lead it back. All right, Jay. Jay you can go. You see, go, go, go. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, that's your addition of a discussion item. So, because that's the next item, is if anybody wants to add a discussion item, since we didn't have the pledge on the agenda, if anybody would like to suggest the discussion item for tonight or for a future agenda item, please do so now. Uh, the reminder that we still have the, uh, we're going to be talking about the, um, whether or not to put board meetings at middle school after the middle school is all finished. We will get to that. Um, so beginning right, right, getting right into our discussion, uh, in item four, uh, four A is the first and beginning tax levy discussion, which will be led by Jay Conn, our business manager. And this is our first uh, tenant begin. It's a tentative approval of the levy, and we will make the final approval for the, of the levy in the November regular board meeting. Okay, I'm gonna just go through. Um, since we just did uh, just pass the 2015-16 budget, I very briefly just remind you what we talked about last meeting. Then do a basic tax levy 101, um, then go through the calculation and talk about the impact of any property tax freeze legislation. Um, this is very similar to the presentation we gave last year, so I'm gonna move through it pretty quickly. Phil, this would be new for you, so please, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me and, and ask. And then go through the re recommendation for, for this year. So our operating budget is balanced. Uh, this is the budget we just passed. Um, and the, the deficit down here is for due to the capital project at the middle school um, for which we just raised money. We'll be using some fund balance and uh, some debt that we just issued. But our revenue is currently equal our expenditures. And we're planning on $15.5 million of revenue. That revenue uh, comes from mostly local property taxes, 92%. Um, the state funding level, it was 4% last year, but in our budget we reduced it to 2% um, just to anticipate any uh, changes in state funding formulas in the future. So we're talking about the terms, we're, here we're talking about the levy. And the levy is a request that a government entity makes uh, to raise property taxes. It is usually for the subsequent year. Taxes are one year in arrears, and it's a and it's pretty much a, a calculation of statutory formula. We make the request by the last Tuesday in December uh, when we don't know all the info yet. And um, the tax extension is the amount that we actually so, extend. So Jay, just years. just so I can put it maybe mm -hmm. summarize the on the levy just for people who are watching. Um, we are using our historical data and your expertise, and based on what we know is coming down, coming up in the future, to request monies for our 16-17 fiscal year. Right, and I'll, get, I'll go through the timeline and show how all that plays in, but the levy is basically just asking for money. Right. So but for we, not this fiscal year, it's for the, the following fiscal right, year. Right, for the following fiscal year. So we're, we, we say, this is how much we, we would like to, to um, collect and then once we go through the calculation when all the variables are known, then the county clerk will say, well, this is your extension. This is this is what they actually build to the taxpayers. 
the levy is just a, we may not extend every dollar that we levy. We levy is just a cost. Okay. Uh, there are 231 taxing districts in Lake County, including schools, libraries, municipalities. We account for about 40% of the average tax bill, the elementary school district. And, um, of the Lake Bluff tax bill. Of the Lake Bluff tax bill. <laughs> 42. 40 percent of the Lake Bluff of your of the Lake Bluff property tax bill comes to the school district. It's a big number. The other big chunk goes to the high school district, high school, and then a lot of the other smaller taxing bodies. Um, so the things that are um, important or the parameters that go into calculating the levy, the biggest one is the equalized assessed value, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, so basically. They use the assessed value of property, which in Illinois statutorily is one third of the market value, uh, except in Cook County. But everywhere else in Illinois, it's one third of the market value, as determined by the assessor. And then um, the term equalized is there because it is um, reviewed. That those assessments are reviewed by at the, at the county level and then again at the state level to make sure that each individual town assessor assessing properties fairly and equally. And so they will look at it and if anybody is over or under assessing, they'll apply a factor to equalize that so that everybody is being fairly assessed because all the individual assessments are done by different people. So someone stands at a macro level and looks at all the individual assessments and says, yes, these are fair and, and uh, accurate, or I think we need to apply a factor to, to bring them in more into line. So that's where, where the um, equalize assess value comes from. And then the consumer price index is the other major um, factor that goes into calculating your tax uh, tax levy. And it's a very specific CPI. Um, it's actually the change in the consumer price index from December to December of the prior year. And that's the number that they use when that, that they apply to uh, figure out your taxes. So they use the CPI that ends December of 15? Uh, they use the December of 2014 CPI. Oh, as applied to their upcoming levy. Right. And then, and, then that'll, and that'll be clear in the next slide. It's going to be pretty close to zero. We need it though. Pretty close. Zero point eight. Yeah. 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 And so then, and this is a very macro level of inflation, so there's some question as to whether or not it's the right CPI to use um, to reflect the costs to the oh, school district, but this is the, the what's used in the formula. Should be the one that says tax cap on it. Doesn't look like it's coming up. I'm not sure what happened in the presentation. It's probably a Mac thing. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry. That's it. So basically, it's the, it's, uh, the first thing is tax cap. It just got distorted a little bit. The tax caps were instituted in October of 1999, and they were designed to keep revenue constant, um, or they were designed to limit growth in an in a, um, environment of rapidly increasing property value. The tax cap formula is really, it's tax cap is probably a poor term. It's really a, um, it's really the correct name for it is the Property Tax Extension Limitation Act. And what it does is it limits the growth in the extension. And so it limits the growth to the uh, lower of CPI, the increase in CPI or 5%. And it was designed to keep, basically to give school districts the same amount of money every year to operate adjusted for inflation under the assumption that their costs are gonna go up every year with inflation, so we're gonna keep their real operating income constant. And then there's also a adjustment for new property, so it also lets you tax new property to bring in money for new property, which also sort of makes sense because new property is generally new houses, which brings students and increased costs to a district. So conceptually, it makes sense. We're gonna keep the district's real income constant and adjust it for, for new population. Um, new property uh, is basically anything that was not taxed the prior year. And 
not all taxes are subject to the tax cap, but only um, so non home rule or home rule uh, municipalities are not subject to the tax cap. So everyone else is. So for example, Village of Lake Bluff is not under the tax cap law, but the Lake Bluff School District is. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, this kind of lays out all the, all the uh, variables and when money is collected. And you can see that it's a very long process. So the money that we're collecting to run our district in fiscal year 20, 2017, um, you know, things that happened back in 2012 are impacting how much money we're collecting here. Uh, so the CPI, as we said, the change in CPI from December 2013 to December 2014 is what goes into the formula. That for us was 0.8%, so we know that with certainty. Then you use the uh, assessed val 2015 assessed value as of January 1st of this year, and this assessed value is based on the prior three years of sales. So the county assessors will look at sales in 2012, 2013, and 2014, and kind of average that all out and apply it to get to our 2015 assessed value. Um, then we file a tax levy in December. So right now we're about here talking about the tax levy. This will be filed with the clerk in December. And then um, final property values don't actually come out until April. And at that time, the tax rates are established and the final taxes are are figured out and that's when any abatements are due. So if um, the district had decided to uh, either levy less than, either extend less than the amount of the levy that we had or to reduce our extension on our debt, if we were to, if we wanted to abate any of our debt payments, we have till April to turn that in. So that's, that's up here. We collect the money in June of September of 2016. Those are the two dates in Lake County when we collect taxes. And then we defer this 2016 payment and it becomes revenue for the fiscal year beginning of, in July of 2016. So that the entire 2015 levy is collected in 2016 and it is revenue for the 2016-2017 school year. So that's a lot of dates and things. Do other districts not defer it? To some don't. Some, you, some use this collection as the, the uh, revenue in the prior fiscal year. So, for example, in, in Round Lake, where I was before this, the first this payment in September would be the first revenue um, collected for that fiscal year, and then the June June taxes would be collected as the second tax yeah. installment for That's that year, we did. and it would span that. So, how are taxes used? Taxes are pretty much uh, we tax for two different purposes: we tax for debt and for um, operations. Um, for debt, this is exist existing debt, and the debt extension is for um, to pay principal and interest of the debt already issued. Any new debt to be issued um, is limited by the tax cap. When the tax caps were originally put into place, there was something called the debt service extension base. And it essentially said, this, the law essentially said, whatever debt service you extend today, you can extend every year in the future without going to referendum. And this is actually what we use this year to um, issue bonds for the middle school. We issued working cash bonds under this rule. We hadn't used any of it. And the law allowed us to issue debt um, of a certain, that could be paid off with a certain annual payment without going to referendum. And that's what we did, uh, subject to certain um, community notifications. Uh, our total debt that is available, we, can, we cannot, as an elementary district, issue more than 6.9% of our EAV is debt. Right now, we are well below that. We're in 50% or so of EAV, so that we're not bumping up against any limits. This is just a um, picture of what our annual debt service looks like uh, for the future. This is a bit with the new debt um, that we just issued included, and this is, this is what uh, we expect for this coming year 2015. Got a level there. And did that on purpose. <laughs> and this this is not part of the tax cap. Um, the other part, the other uh, taxes that we issue are for operating, and this is capped. Um, you can only increase your operating rate by referendum. Uh, and uh, this operate these operating monies also include your capital and life safety funds. 
Uh, so who pays the taxes? Taxes are distributed equally um, on a pro rata basis to all the assessed property in the district. This is the makeup of uh, Lake Bluff. We're 88% residential, 8% commercial, and then the balance is industrial and farm and railroad. And every single property in Lake Bluff represents a tiny slice of this pie. Tax limits are calculated. Again, this is uh, just pictorially. What we do is we take the prior year extension, so this is what we levied last year. We increase it by CPI um, to, again, uh, grow it in, in uh, nominal terms or keep it, keep it constant in real terms. And then we add um, new, the taxes on new property. So total taxes, taxes in, 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 uh, in whole that the district gets, uh, taxes on existing property do not ever go up by more than CPI in the tax cap district. So as a, so the, the school district or the, the extension, you can look at what we levied last year on existing property, and that is grown, that actually, the growth in that is limited to CPI or 5%, whichever is lower. And that, that's a statement for all property inclusive, all, all existing property. Right, right. all because existing property. properties, it can go up. If it were assessed, if, you, if your property was assessed, well, yeah, if your property was assessed last year, so take the, the total global property, assessed last year, the taxes on that, the total taxes for that same property the following year, the total does not increase by more than the CPI. On that individual property? On the, on, in total. In yeah, total, right. So the aggregate levy right. on existing property last year, um, you look at that same property the next year, and again, and you add it all up, right. and the totals are different by CPI. Right. And that's a good point. And so what I'm sort of getting at is that how do we allocate these taxes and what impacts, what's the primary driver of individual tax, of changes in individual tax rates? The way that they distribute those taxes is by the tax rate. So first we calculate how much money we need by saying, well, how much do we have last year? We're gonna grow that by CPI because we expect our cost to increase by CPI this year. And then how we distribute that again to, to all the property in the district. And you do that by taking, again, the total extension that you need and you divide it by the total EAV of all the property to get the tax rate. And then you apply that individual that tax rate to each individual property. So again, in total, you're taking the total the total dollars of the taxes that we need, you're dividing it by the total EAV to get the tax rate. And then you go backwards and you apply that individual tax rate to each to each property to distribute the tax to each property. So you can see that in the, in the past, as the EAV was dropping, your tax rate is gonna go up to compensate. So an increase in tax rates doesn't necessarily mean that your taxes are going up. It just means that we, in order to, the tax rate is simply just a method to distribute the total property tax. And if, as we've had in the past years, we had significant declines in EAV, you see significant increases in tax rate, but that's very separate from its significant increases in taxes. So, Jay, I think an important point that I, I hope I'm communicating this correctly is that the district does not directly calculate taxes on individual homeowners. Correct. It's a function of the township doing their assessments and the county putting it all together and coming up with the total EAV, right? That's correct. Right. So if you look at um, your pro individual property assessment, that can be the biggest driver in your individual tax rate. If, so said another way, if all the slices of the pie stayed the same size, mm -hmm. then everybody's taxes will go up by CPI. Uh, the reason that your taxes could go up by more than CPI is if your property value increased more than everybody else's did. If you're living in a section of town or if you, you did something, you improved your home, um, you know, if, if your assessment goes up more than everyone else's assessment went up, then you're taking a bigger piece of that pie. Or if your your value in the you know in, in recent years property value has been going down. If your property value went down less than everyone else's, it's the same thing. But wait, wait. If your property value decreased less than the average, right? So if everyone else's property value went down more than your property value, right? But what if mine went down more than theirs? Then, then, my, then you would you see you you would see your individual tax bill decline, right? But that so the second comment there, your property value decreases as an average. Your taxes won't go up in that case. 
you say your taxes might go up by more than the CPI if, under number two, your property value decreases. I think your taxes will go down if your property value decreases, correct? Decreases less, no, so if your property value decreases, than everybody else. Right, so then that's kind of the point is that it's, a, it's, a, it's a, less than average. Less than, yeah, than the average property decrease. Right. So if all properties went down 10%. Oh, less than the average property. And your property went down 5% value. in value. Yeah, okay. Then you're you're getting a bigger piece of that pie. And your wages expand and you're getting more of the tax burden. And so this is similarly, if a large retailer, so if a large retailer leaves town or a large company, like if you're a town with a very concentrated tax base, you have a couple um, like us. taxpayers who are who are very large. Actually, we don't. I mean, we're no. If you look, when we did our bond offering, they look at your big largest taxpayers and the largest 10 taxpayers only accounted for a couple percent of our total taxes. Because you're not paying taxes yet, like Target. Right, but so, you know, I mean, Target's a good example. Now, Target really isn't, I'll show you how much it's being assessed at, but it's not really that big. But say Target was this huge retailer. When they come in, they shift the, they increase the commercial size of that commercial wedge and make the residential wedge smaller. So they're taking a bigger share of the tax burden and you're taking a smaller share. So all things being equal, you're getting a larger, you're getting a smaller share of that. But typically those newer companies, I don't know if Target was the case, they break deals in the first four or five well, years. So. Most of their deals are sales tax, not property tax. So does, shall we go on? Or? No, I got it. Okay. So then, then the question becomes, how do we tax new property? And this is, um, uh, this is kind of extra. So we've we've taken the existing property and we've explained how that grows by CPI and gets distributed. And then there's all this new property that wasn't assessed last year. So a good example is Target. Target was not in our tax rolls last year. We have to extend taxes on them this year. And so the tax rate, it's basically the tax rate that we calculated from all the existing property multiplied by the EAV of the new property. So that's completely incremental because we just, we calculated the tax rate just based on existing EAV and existing money. And now we're applying that to new property, that same rate. So all that new property is basically 100% incremental revenue to the district. But the problem is we don't know what the tax rate is yet. Now we're doing the levy. We don't know what the, we don't know uh, what the EAV on the new property is going to be yet. So we're just kind of guessing. and. The rule says that basically they, they will levy the ta they will levy up to what we ask for. So as a school district, we don't want to ask for too little because we won't get it. If if um, if that new property, say if Target was valued at two million dollars and you multiply that all out and it's worth a hundred thousand dollars of new property or new taxes, we only asked for seventy-five, we would only get the seventy-five. But if we ask for 150 and, and it's really worth 100, then we get the full 100. So um, this will, I will show you later in the presentation what my estimate of new property is going to be based on talking with the assessor. And then I'm going to come back in the calculation and show you a different number when I actually use my levy, when I do my levy calculations. Um, because I don't want to underestimate it. Because if I'm wrong, then the district loses that incremental taxing authority. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk lately about um, in the legislature about a two-year property tax freeze and so this right here is just an example this is my current projection for what our property taxes will do over the next five years um, so right here this is this is a this is this year's levy this is what we levied last year this is operating funds only so the way i calculate my new levy and it's a little bit hard to see the numbers but i take last year's levy and i grow it by cpi so about a hundred and $114,000, these are all in thousands, is basically this year's extension times that 0.8%. So that's where we get the new property, or the, I'm sorry, the CPI growth. And then this $89,000 is all, is basically all the new property. So this would be our new extension. And then the same thing would happen in 2016. We would take our um, last year's extension, we'd grow up by CPI, and then we would add the new property. Well, the 258 that's in there now, that's not an increase of 0.8%. No, that's, so what I'm doing is I'm using what I know for this year, which is, and I'll tell you what the assumptions are. I didn't put them on the slide, but what I've assumed here is the 0.8% for this year, because it's known. And then 
I've got three and a half million dollars of new property in both of these years, um, based on, again, data. And then for the out years I'm growing it, it's a CPI of 2%, which mm -hmm. is just the long-term average. Mm -hmm. And I'm using new property of two and a half million dollars each okay. year. So th those are the assumptions that go into this, and this is what it would look like under those assumptions. So it can change significantly depending on what the CPI is, but sure. at a 2% CPI, this is what it would look like with two and a half million dollars in new property annually. And so if we, if what they're talking about is doing a property tax freeze in 2016 and 2017, and basically saying, setting CPI to zero in those years. So we would be losing those green boxes, 200, almost $300,000 each year. We would still get the new property. We'd still get the 91,000 and the 66,000, but we would lose these two boxes. However, it's not quite as straightforward or as simple as that. Those boxes don't just disappear um, and we only lose $300,000. What happens is, uh, again, if you use, if you go through the formula, this is this year, we take this year's property taxes and we don't grow it now because we have no CPI, CPI is zero. We just get the new property. And then the next year, we also grow it uh, just by new property, but not at CPI. And then after this freeze is over for these two years, we go back to getting our CPI at 2%. So now we take the prior year and we grow it by 2% and we get a new property. So because the extension is based on the extension from the year before, we, lo we lose this $290,000 this year, but then we lose it again this year, and we lose it again this year, and this year, and this year. So the first year we lose the $300,000, the next year we lose $600,000 because we've lost basically CPI growth compounded for those two years. And then every year after that we lose another $600,000 grown for inflation. So a, a two-year property tax freeze, instead of being $600,000 over five years, becomes $2.7 million. So if you were doing a long-term five-year projection and just projecting conservatively 2% CPI growth and $2.5 million of new property, and then, and then the legislature, and you're, you're saying right now our five years out after the middle school, actually, sorry, at the end of next fiscal year, we're saying our fund balance will be six and a half million dollars. You know, if the legislature passes a two-year property tax freeze, then five years out, we would be at six and a half million less 2.7, unless we were able to trim $600,000 a year off, off of our operating budget. So it's a pretty significant impact to a, district's ability, a district like ours who relies on local property taxes for 90 plus percent of our revenue, um, to, you know, it's a pretty big impact to our ability to operate and, and raise funds. If I'm reading this correctly, as, can, can I say that in the two years of the property tax freeze, if it goes as we think it's going to go in 16 and 17, in those two years, by the end of 2017, we will have lost out on between eight hundred and fifty and nine hundred thousand dollars. Yes. In those two years long. And that's assuming and that compounds. And that's assuming a two percent CPI. Yeah. So if CPI comes in at one percent, then we will actually have only lost that one percent instead of two mm -hmm. percent. CPI comes in at three, we you know we might do more, but basically, you know, two percent is pretty much the middle ground. But nine hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money for right. us to be just able. over two years, yeah. and then we lose another six hundred every year after that. Right. So getting back to this uh, this year, or um, what we know. So last, the December 2014 CPI was 0.8%. Last year, the, the CPI was 1.5%. So this year, our revenue is going to be growing at a significantly slower rate. Um, the, equalized, the existing equalized assessed property value is estimated to be pretty much flat. So I'm not expecting any property growth for new, for existing property uh, at all. Last year's existing property EAV increased by a little over a percent. And that's still because that's of the lag. Increased by a little over that's percent. because of the three-year lag we're using for EAV, right? I mean, it's right. properties so, are moving now, but that we won't feel that for a few more years. Exactly. Property values were going down for a long time, but as I showed in that slide, they take the prior three years of average sales, so there's a lag. So as property property values are starting to come up now, and I'll show you the data in a, in a second, but because you're still being averaging those prior lower years in. 
12, 13, 14? 12, 13, and 14? 12, uh, 12, 13, and 14, mm -hmm. right. So last year our property was still decreasing. Now we're at flat. Next year I would expect it to increase. Um, and then to, in addition, 2015 is a quadrennial reassessment year in Lake County. So between every four years, the assessor basically looks at everything and reassesses all property. Uh, between that time, they're just taking sales and looking at those sales and how and try and uh, trying to estimate what property is worth and they just apply an adjustment to every property, but they're not evaluating each piece of property. They only do that once every four years. So what happens, what tends to happen in a reassessment year is that you get a very high level of um, tax objections. There were a number people. of major changes in Right, and, and it's also because it tends to be the biggest change, right. right? They're not just applying a small factor to yeah. adjust for you know one year's of history. They were going back and saying, well, last year it was assessed, or four years ago it was assessed at this, now I'm looking at everything and I'm going to assess you at that. And they may be very different. So um, it, depending on your assessor, you can see some significant changes. Um, so there tends to be a lot of tax appeals. So basically that means there's, you know, we, we are notified of any appeal um, or objection that is in excess of $100,000 of UAV. And normally it's a handful. And this year I got the list and it was over two pages long. So there's a significant level of uncertainty because they're gonna look at those between now and April and try to get them out of the way so that there's no, they don't go to the property tax appeals board. Um, if they can agree on an assessment now, then that just goes into our, it gets averaged into our total EAV. If they can't, what happens is people pay their taxes based on the high assessment, but then it goes to a separate board for an appeal. And if that board, reduces the value, then that person gets a refund. So that is money that comes straight out of the district. Um, whereas if we can, basically if someone gets their property reduced now, then that ta those taxes just get redistributed out amongst all the other property. But if it gets assessed, if it gets done, reassessed later, then we already got the money and we just have to give it back. So it's money, we get less yeah. money. And the, the two page list you have, that's mm -hmm. residential properties that are valued. It's everything, it's commercial and residential. Everything that in the, in the district boundaries where their assessment went up over $100,000. Where they're requesting a reduction in assessment of over $100,000. So they're, so they're looking at their assessment and saying, this is too high, I think it should be, instead of being this, I think it should be that. Oh, and if that difference is more than $100,000 of a decrease, then we get notified of it. and. We have an attorney who tries to cut a deal somewhere in the middle, to, as I said, to try to get it, re, you know, a value. Or, and also the, the assessor um, defends his, his property insurance, sure. so he'll go to court, but we also have an attorney who we have. Um, who does our attorney cut a deal with? The, the, the county? With the assessor. Okay. And, and the, they, the two of them will work out a strategy and say, you know, they'll basically look at the assessments and say, yeah, I think this is a fair, you know, I think this assessment is out of whack, this is a fair reduction, or no, this person's crazy. And, because basically we have to go to court, we have to go out and spend money to get um, appraisals. Right. Right. And so it, it's costly it's from that it. standpoint, it's costly from paying an attorney. And then we also have to refund the money if we lose. So all in all, it's better to get it out of the way now. But what it means is that it, both with new property and with what our total EAV is, there's a little bit more uncertainty this year than there are. In but I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about this and uh, I haven't spoken with anyone whose assessment went down this year. Yeah. And in most cases, the assessments went up significantly, sometimes 20%. Right. So it's not surprising that these appeals have taken place. And in but Lake County, they, it depends very much on the individual assessors, which is why we equalize. Right. And in Lake County, we have seen a lot of that. And I think that's the opinion of our attorney that some of the assessments aren't probably accurate. Um, this is the data from this year. And so what they do is, they basically look at, look at the 12, 13, and 14 um, adjustment or sales data. And what they're trying to remember, again, they're trying to get to 33.3% um, of market value for assessed value. So if this number is higher than 33%, that means they need to adjust it, put an adjustment on to reduce it. So that then property value would go down. If that factor is less than 33%, it means that it goes up we've been uh, under assessing and we need to apply a factor to increase the assessments. So this is, these are all the townships in Lake County. 
And if I pull out Shields Township, which is pretty much we're 95% Shields Township, you can see that in this first year, um, this is a 4.2% reduction. And then um, you know, this is a 4.6% increase. And this is a 16% increase, so 17%. So John, your estimate wasn't too far off. Uh, and then, so they go through and calculate it, and then this tentative multiplier comes out June 1st or June 6th, and they basically said, based on all of our reassessments, we think property is going to go up by 5%. Or, on average, all property in Shields Township is worth 5% more this year than it was last year. Uh, and then, so what ended up happening was, if you look at, you know, ours was 105, there's a lot of 105s, 104s, 103s, and the county assessor looked at it and and what when he and basically said well i want the tentative multiplier to be one so they applied it they basically reduced it and said you know all these individual assessors we don't think are fair we don't think everybody's assessing equally among the townships or we think our assessors are assessing higher than assessors in other counties and i don't he basically overrode their their calculations and reduced it down to one one percent or to even flat zero percent. So that's why I'm saying flat property, flat existing property for this year, because that's what the um, that's the the recommendation. That's the the county equalization factor that gets applied to the value of all homes as one. Well. And so that, that's just a good um, illustration of the equalization process. So to a new property for next year, I'm estimating three and a half million. Uh, this is what it looks like for this year. I just pulled out some of the specifics. Uh, the target, we're getting almost 500,000 of, of new EAV, and this is only 30% of the target. So what they do for new property is, if especially commercial property, if it gets put into service in uh, late in the year, oh, really, the value of the property is on is on January 1st of that year, but if it gets put into service in the fall, they'll still record a percentage of that new property to that current um, tax year, and then the remainder would become new property in the next tax year. So this 460 at 30% will translate to about a million dollars next year. So I, I can already count on 70% of that target for next year, and that's another million dollars of uh, new property value for next year and that's new taxable value um, and then this is just a, a couple of you know the others that make up that three and a half million and this is historically what's happened last year it was two and a half million <coughs> um, 3.2 the year before and 1.3 the year before that so you can see we're starting to get a little bit more activity in the market also um, with new housing uh, and you know, some commercial activity and in the district. So my recommendation for the tax levy uh, is to basically maximize the 2015 tax levy under the property tax limitation law um, to protect our fund balance. <clears throat> we don't know if they're going to pass legislation um, to freeze our property taxes in the future, but uh, given all of, given the potential reductions in state funding and the potential um, impairment of our property tax funding, we should make sure to protect our current fund balance um, because we may need it in, in their future. <clears throat> and then we still have <coughs> until April to, once we know exactly what um, our new property is going to be and what our EAV is going to be, at that point we'll know what our revenue is going to be and we can make the determination at that time if we want to go ahead with the $150,000 debt service abatement that was contemplated when the debt was restructured in 2013, or whether we want to hold off on that um, because we're anticipating some legislative change that will you know, not give us the flexibility to do that. Uh, here's my calculation. Um, for 2015, I'm taking our last year's EAV, growing it by 0.8%, and adding $5 million of new property. Uh, you can see our EAV is growing by $5 million, 565.3 to 560.3. That's entirely new property because I'm saying existing property is flat. 
Um, but also remember, a couple of slides ago, I told you I think our new property is going to be three, three and a half million dollars. When I do the calculation for the levy, I'm using five million because I don't want to underestimate. You know, there's there's still a chance that um, new property can be added to the tax rolls. I know they were waiting for the subway and the Chipotle and the meatheads and all that to come online, and we might get a small percentage of that. Plus, there's just variability. These are all estimates at this point, and a lot can change. And I don't want to ask for too little because yourself in the foot. yeah, if that new property basically we'll get, get that new the taxes on a new property, and that's 100 percent incremental, doesn't impact our existing taxpayers, and it's um, revenue that the just that will compound in the future. So if if I miss out on it this year, we don't get the CPA IGRF on that in the future. Either. So, but if you guess high, and they'll just bring you down. They'll just bring it down yeah. exactly what it is. So if your property is 3.7 million, then we get 3.7 credit for the 3.7. Yeah. So I'm I'm putting five in my calculation. I don't know. I think it's going to be, be safe. Enough. It's it's a conservative strategy. Uh, this calculates out to 14.3 million dollars in operating um, revenue, which is a 0.8 percent increase because it went up by CPI. The impact of this new property at um, five million dollars is 127 thousand dollars. I think it'll probably be less than that, but I don't want to ask for less than uh, that. So it gives us a total operating levy of $14.4 million, or, growth, or total growth of 1.7%, uh, which gives us an operating tax rate of 2.553. Uh, and then this shows you what our debt service extension will be now. Our, the debt service is not a part of the levy. The, debt, the, the county will automatically extend the amount of our um, principal and interest payments next year without us having to um, ask for it. If we want to ask for less, we can say, hey, we want to, we want you to reduce that by a certain amount. We can do that in April. But um, by adding, so this is the levy, 14.4 million. The total tax extension with that levy next year would be 15.58, um, which is growth of 7% in total extension um, for a tax rate of just under $3 per hundred dollars. Wait, going from 15, 7% of what? 7% growth, so 15.6 well, 15, 15. 15. over 15 no. point. I don't think that's 7%, is it? 15,557 and 15,581 is only about $30,000. 30, um, it's probably 0.7%. That's, that's possible that I you count this one. Yeah, it's not 7%. It's a big number. Well, uh, you're either that or I have a math there somewhere because 14.4 plus 2.2 isn't 15.5. I think that's what it that's is. That's what it is. Yeah, that's that's the mistake there. Seventeen something. It's 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 uh fourteen four and sixteen six. Yeah. So it is a seven percent growth. Yeah, just the numbers wrong. I okay. Just, uh, okay. Actually, that may be sixteen point five eight one. Okay. So, thank you. Um. That's it. So if there's any questions. The complexity is always mind-boggling. Yeah, <laughs> all the pieces, all the pieces of the puzzle that come together. It's typical it? sort of mind-boggling government stuff, you know. <laughs> and you don't know the answer until the end. What is it? Right yeah, before the yeah. right. I mean, they do use. They, they there's a there's a lag also. Like we're using the CPI from two years ago almost to calculate the yeah. taxes from yeah. two years yeah. from now. So you know, there's some. They do it for practical reasons, obviously, because you have to know how much to, to be able to calculate things. But at the same time, if you're trying to match your revenue to your expenses, that you know, it, again, is that the right CPI to use? One, it's two years too late, and also it's for a basket of goods that a school district isn't buying. And you may say, you know, you're you're buying salaries and healthcare and primarily, and you know that that CPI is calculated based on a variety of other things. So we're, we're probably seeing, the school district is probably seeing inflation in excess of CPI, you know, three, four, or 5% with the way healthcare inflation is. Look, as simply as put as you're, you're looking at, we're actually dealing with the current CPI and you're levying taxes based on one that's however many years old. I mean, right. Not to mention that we're looking at a different basket of goods. That's a good point as well. It's, it's as clear as anybody can make it, let's put it that way. <laughs> but no, you do a really good job with it. The process, I mean, it's like watching a sausage being made. Yeah. <laughs> it's dirty and, you know, like the assessments, it's hard to understand what the assessors do. And you, you call them up and half, you know, some of them 
are good and know what they're doing, and others you know, like, just don't understand. And so it's very, um, you know, there's a lot of people involved in the process, so they try to, you know, it, it does get complicated. It, the, the calculation itself is actually pretty s simple algebra, but the pieces that go into it is where the complexity comes in, and understanding how it all, what the levers are and how it all works. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Questions? All good? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you just, for the record, state the next couple of steps in here? Like, when are we going to, are we going to see it how many more times before we approve it? So we're going to do it a month early this year. Um, it's due the last Tuesday of December to the county. Uh, but since we um, are getting a head start on it, and we've discussed it today, at the October board meeting, we'll present a tentative levy. <clears throat> and we will do, um, we'll submit that will be on display for 30 days for public review and comment. And then we'll hold a hearing, a okay. text public hearing, yep. uh, right before the November meeting. And that here we'll also have, it's called the Truth in Taxation hearing. Now, because our levy, our operating amount is not going up by more than 5%, we're not legally required to do a Truth in Taxation hearing. We do one every year for transparency reasons because we want to explain and you know, be very open with the community. Um, so we will do a truth and taxation hearing where we will um, again present what we want to levy and then people have a, op a, the opportunity to comment. And then at the close of that hearing, we'll open the board meeting and at the board meeting you'll approve the final levy. And then that final levy will, will be what goes to the county. Um, that's that is not due until the end of December, but we'll approve it in November mm -hmm. and, get it, and get it turned in early just to make sure we're good. So, so the board will see it. They're going to do tentative at the end of the month. It'll be back at the committee of the whole in November. And then the final approval will be at the November meeting. So you'll see it three more times. Okay. And if somebody, when it's on uh, public... What do you call it? On, on display? Yeah, it'll be on our website. Oh, on the website. If somebody I wants to look at it. district office. If someone wants to look at it, they can. Um, there's a, you'll pass, a, you'll pass the tentative levy and it'll um, spell out how much in each fund we want to. So that won't get put up until after we pass the tentative levy at right. the end of the month. Right. 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 Okay. And, so, and also, I, I sort of, I know I did address it a little bit, sort of glossed over the fact that this is an aggregate, so we're actually levying different funds. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's the IMRF fund and the transportation fund, and there's a little bit more complexity in there in terms of um, the resolution. And we're we're asking for we're asking to levy taxes for specific purposes, for transportation, for education, for operations and maintenance, and that'll all be delineated in that um, resolution that's passed in the tentative hearing that is on display. And if people have questions about it, they're welcome to contact me at the district office, and I'm happy to. Thanks. Anybody else? Questions? Thanks, Jay. Uh, okay. Continue with discussion items. B, that we can put a line through. I, I, I had asked you to put in a request that I might need coverage at. There's an NSSCD meeting tomorrow, but I will not. Um, that's fine. I've got that covered. Mm -hmm. um, item C, Lake Bluff Middle School Renovations and Village of Lake Bluff. Uh, coordination and approvals. Basically, we were just going to go over, uh, Mark and I and Jay met with um, the engineers in the village along with Drew Urban and um, our architects. And our engineers. And our, our engineers. engineers. And we had a large discussion about, around the drawings and approvals for the village of Lake Bluff. I thought it was a very... A large tentative discussion. You know, tentative. It, it, was, it was just kind of give them an overview of, of what we're doing, get their feedback. It was a very collaborative meeting. I think that um, our our white team knows some of the some of the minor changes that needed to be made and what the requirements are, and then the village I think felt pretty good about the designs and where we were going with everything. Got some great feedback from uh, Kathy O'Hare. Uh, I had mean, I had coffee with her the next when it was following that meeting and had with uh, Rob. Douglas from Park District as well, and kind of went over what we're doing with them. And both those guys were particularly impressed with, with what we're doing. And we'll be great ambassadors in the community for the project. But Kathy had sat down with Drew after our big meeting, and Drew was very fair, but positive with her about you know, sharing and the cooperation and the spirit of it all. So it was a very positive thing. 
So the question that Mark and I have, um, and I'm going to send these dates to you in my update this week, but we have one, two, three, four. There's five meetings between October 21st and January 11th that are official meetings that the village will be doing approvals for. Um, and one well, of the well, they're village meetings, just to be clear. Yeah. Right. The PCCBA and the what's uh, the other one? The uh, sorry, what are ABR. The, ABR. So there are these are village meetings that our team goes to, and we get the Lake Bluff Village approvals. The question that we had was, um, if we have to bring everything back to the board, all these times we're going to have to have extra meetings, or if we can continue to di just use Mark and Leanne, Leanne should be back at meetings pretty soon, and just update you through board updates as to what's going on with the village. We'd send you um, any board packet materials that are going to them, we would also send to our own board. And we were just wondering what your feelings are as far as any of this going to these so, boards. So to be clear, we're talking, if I understand right, we're talking about uh, feedback we get from PCCBA and the ABR about things that need to be tweaked on our plans. And then you guys, okay. It's us. really before the feedback though. It's what we're submitting, they wanted to know what we're submitting to the village if the board needs to see it before oh, we before. submit to the village. So basically you want us to deputize you to present what you right. think is relevant right. to the village. I certainly have no problem with that. No, I, don't I think that's that. a good idea. Yeah, it's fine with me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I will always make sure that you get all the materials that are going to the village when I get them. Mm -hmm. Yep, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. It's going to be a busy process because if you recall, we, mm -hmm. we just approved speeding up that schedule and so they it's just going to start going crazy in the next few months. And certainly, if any of you have free time, these meetings would might be very interesting for you to drop in and come and Especially watch. Especially if you're an insomniac. <laughs> so I, I'll send you the dates also. Okay. But literally, every two weeks, we've got something due, and they're taking a look and working so on this, this is where people from the community at each one of these committee hearings could come out, and they would, you know, neighbors have a problem with, yep. you know, what something's going to look like, or... Yeah. And we've asked uh, the architect to, to that point specifically, to come in with uh, mock-ups of the exterior of the building, photographs that have been photoshopped to show what we expect it to look like, and 3D renderings of the interior, so the community and the different uh, boards that we have to present to will really get a, a really good feel for how this is going to impact their neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Comments? All right, I will send this all this week then. Great. Uh, then the final thing on our discussions is um, something that it just feels like we just did this yesterday, <laughs> talking yeah. about the superintendent evaluation <laughs> form. Uh, this happens very fast, and Gene is going to just talk about it briefly. Actually, I, we were, last year, if I remember correctly, we had several of us meet and make a couple tweaks, and before we get any further, if we're going to make tweaks, we'd have to make it now, or is it just okay to use it the way we've got it? And if I can just point out that every time I do it, nobody's really satisfied with it, and I don't think we're going to make it all that much better, so why don't we just deal with it? Is my recommendation. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Wholeheartedly. Go with it. Easy. Go with the existing right. form. Uh, is, there, right. is there a big section for Unless, general comments? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, there are. You can comment like crazy on it. You can comment as much. This is before your time, right? Everything. Okay, so we we in the past mm -hmm. couple of years we've um, formed subcommittees to go over the evaluation document. And we made changes, made tweaks, and every time we sit down and do the evaluation, the biggest complaints are, it's got nothing to do with Gene. It's always, she's great, this form is horrible, we hate that, we don't like this rating it's scale. It's cumbersome. It's just, it's, 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 uh, but it's no so much more to do it. So it's, and there's, and, more of a, so, and there's so many different perspectives on it that we'll never really right. come up with the perfect form. Right. But if you want to lead the charge after you run through your first <laughs> one, you are going to want them to head that committee next year. <laughs> If we're going to do that, we should start meeting now for a year from now. My, myself for my own people, which we're going to And that is, that's our last discussion item. Okay. Unless okay. anyone else wants to freeze. This could be the shortest board meeting ever. Right, I'll wrap it up. Uh, uh, we, we now have a chance to offer the opportunity for public comment. If anyone would like to address the board, please do so now. Uh, also, don't hesitate to reach us out to us uh, via the internet. And our web or email addresses are all on the, the uh, school website. If I've got no further 
Uh, questions or comments from the board? I would like to ask for a uh, motion to adjourn at 7.59. So, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, aye. <laughs> Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.